Hey all, Alex here at your home of the Music Deep Dive. And today it is time for another discography ranking. And today we're going to be talking about the British pop rock band, cultural monolith, and pervasive influence on the world of recorded music, the Beatles. There's no quick way to talk about the impact in history of the Beatles, especially not when they happen to be your favorite group of all time, but we will give it a try. A lot of this, I'm sure, is common knowledge for most music fans, but again, I don't want to assume anything of anybody, so I do want to give at least some overview of their story and explain their significance, maybe for some people who don't understand where that significance comes from. The Beatles started life as a high school band named The Quarry Men, formed in Liverpool by student John Lennon in 1956. The band played a genre called skiffle music, which is an English genre kind of inspired by folk music, and didn't really have a stable lineup for its first couple of years. Lennon, who played guitar and was the lead singer, was the only constant until he was introduced to another guitarist and singer, Paul McCartney, at a town event in July 1957. A third guitarist, George Harrison, was brought into the group by McCartney the following year, and this trio would form the core of the band for what ended up being the foreseeable future. It was not until 1960 that the group changed their name to The Beatles. Bass guitar would be played by a friend of Lennon's named Stuart Sutcliffe for a couple of years before McCartney switched over to the instrument, and the drums were handled by a rotating cast of characters until a fellow named Pete Best was brought on, simply because he owned a kit and could play someone in time. The band played mostly local clubs in Liverpool at first until a residency in Hamburg in 1960 not only widened their exposure, but helped transform what at the time was a pretty poor band into a really experienced, professional, quality group. The best in Liverpool, with the largest repertoire of cover songs and even some originals that anybody had. In short, they became really good because they practiced a lot. The Beatles would go to Hamburg several more times and even cut a record over there, which caught the eye of a Liverpool record shop owner named Brian Epstein. Epstein would become the Beatles' manager and eventually secured them a recording contract in mid-1962 with Parlophone Records and A&R man slash producer George Martin. Before the band's first single was properly recorded, however, the band decided to kick out Pete Best as he was not an especially good player and personality-wise he did not fit in with the sarcasm and charisma of the other three. Best was replaced by the man many considered to be Liverpool's best drummer at the time, Richard Starkey better known by his stage name, Ringo Starr. Starr already knew the band from spending time with them in Hamburg, and the four of them would go on to record their first single, which went to the top 20 in the UK charts, and then their second, which hit number one, as did their third, as did their fourth, and so on and so forth. By the end of 1963, the Beatles' brand of what was called beat music, a fusion of rock, skiffle, R&B, and other genres, both British and American, and their stage performances had made them the biggest band in England, and in fact, really the biggest band in Europe. At the time, it was unusual for British acts to break through across the pond in the United States, but after the group signed with Capitol Records for U.S. distribution, their first single on the label, I Want to Hold Your Hand, went to number one in January 1964. And thus, the floodgates were opened. The success of that single and the band's subsequent U.S. promo appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show initiated the cultural phenomenon known as Beatlemania. Younger and older audiences alike were captivated by these four guys, much in the same way that Elvis had launched a craze of sorts nearly a decade earlier. The band spent the next uh, two and a half years on a non-stop schedule that included touring, television and radio appearances, feature films, interviews, and, of course, recording new music. The group's level of acclaim meant that they essentially had carte blanche over the recording studio that they utilized, and as the group evolved as musicians and the world around them changed, kind of thinking about the popularity of marijuana and LSD at that time, uh, their recordings became increasingly complex. It was getting to the point where the band couldn't replicate some of these albums and songs live, and even if they could, the noise of the crowds was so deafening that nobody could hear them, and they couldn't even hear each other. 
After a frustrating 1966 that saw John Lennon get canceled by the Bible Belt region of the United States, the band nearly being held hostage in the Philippines, and just general tensions with the state of their fame, the band decided to stop touring entirely and focus on studio work. Obviously, it was not a popular decision. The first single that came out afterwards was the first they released in almost five years not to hit number one, but the band's next album release was a little record called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which became the soundtrack to the so-called Summer of Love of 1967, and really also legitimized the serious study of pop music as a subject. It's possible that if that record was never released, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. But eventually, the wheels came off. Manager Brian Epstein died in August 1967, and the band struggled to try and keep their financial affairs straight. The arguments about business drove a wedge between McCartney in particular and the other members, even as they formed their own company, Apple Corps, and their own record label, Apple Records. The band was also diverging creatively. Lennon and McCartney, to this day the world's most recognized songwriting partnership, were writing separately more often than together, and Harrison was growing frustrated with his own songs being treated as second-rate compared to theirs. There are many reasons why the band drifted apart. There are whole books that have been written about the breakup of the Beatles, but business and creative differences are really the core of it. Tensions would come to a head during the recording of 1968's self-titled record, aka the White Album, and later on as well while filming a television special that would never be aired as intended, Get Back. When McCartney opposed the band bringing in Rolling Stones manager Alan Klein, but was outvoted, the gulf between everybody became insurmountable. After releasing Abbey Road in 1969, Lennon left the band quietly to pursue solo projects and created pursuits with his wife, Yoko Ono. The band continued publicly as if they were still together, but after McCartney was asked to push back the release of his own solo album to accommodate another Beatles album, Let It Be, well, Paul went nuclear. On April 10th, 1970, a press kit for McCartney's new album included quotes of Paul saying, in effect, the Beatles were finished. It took four more years of very public lawsuits and fighting for the band to officially dissolve, but the creative partnership was clearly over from that point on. Of course, all four Beatles stayed in the public eye, all four of them went on to pursue solo careers, and in fact, all of them went on to have multiple number one hits as solo artists. Lennon became a public activist to the point where he was almost deported from the United States. After taking a step back from music to raise a family, his return to the music business in 1980 was cut short by an assassin's bullet outside his New York apartment at only 40 years old. Harrison was also a prominent peace activist organizing the famous concert for Bangladesh, and after losing interest in music to focus on Formula One racing and running an independent film studio, he would also stage a comeback in the late 1980s. He was diagnosed with cancer in 1997 and would ultimately pass away in 2001. Starr pursued joint careers in music and film, but both petered out by the late 70s, which led him into a cycle of alcoholism and drug abuse that continued for over a decade. He eventually went to rehab, relaunched his music career, and to this day, tours with his backing band of rock music all-stars called, fittingly, the All-Star Band. And McCartney has been arguably the most successful of the bunch commercially, forming his own band Wings in 1971 that released a litany of hit singles and albums, as well as organizing one of the earliest stadium tours in rock history. To name uh, just a few other things, McCartney has released solo albums, cover albums, classical pieces, experimental music, electronic music, an anonymous easy listening record, and much, much more, and you can still find him performing live to this day. This is all only scratching the surface, of course, but just let me say, just to kind of conclude this intro, it is unheard of for a musical act as removed from the present day as the Beatles are to be this relevant. In just the last three years, the band has released a successful documentary directed by Peter Jackson released a new single built off of archival Lennon and Harrison recordings that went to number one in the UK and top 10 in the US. And as of this video, apparently have four biopics being produced simultaneously about each of the members. Again, it's just the, the only words you can think of are unheard of. It's a level of stature that very few musicians have ever come close to approaching. Michael Jackson and Taylor Swift 
uh, two of the closest examples we've really seen since that time. But speaking of time, let's not waste any more of it with the preamble. You know who they are. Let's talk about the music. So the Beatles have 12 standard studio albums using the Canon UK list of records. We're not ranking the US albums here. But as is the case with most Beatles rankings, there will be 13 albums actually included in this ranking. This is because Magical Mystery Tour was released as an EP in the UK, but as an LP in the United States containing some of the band's most recent singles. The reason why Magical Mystery Tour is considered canon is because, one, the US release did actually come out a little bit earlier, and the band themselves have treated it as canon. It's the US version that has been used for CD re-releases. It's the US version that's on streaming. And again, every sort of thing in between. So almost everybody treats this as a Canon Studio LP. I'm not going to treat it any differently than that. And with that, let's get on to my number 13. Number 13, I have 1969's Yellow Submarine. This is most people's bottom, in large part because this is 50% a Beatles record and 50% and orchestral soundtrack from the animated film. Now, I'm not going to necessarily go entirely justice for Yellow Submarine in this review, but I do want to talk about the film score because most people, when they review the album, hardly mention it. I think in large part because they don't know how to talk about it because they don't have experience talking about film soundtracks, which is perfectly fine. And not to paint myself as an expert either. But I really like the film score here. Uh, it's not necessarily top shelf stuff. I think there are certain arrangements here. I'm thinking of especially the kind of fanfare at the very end, Yellow Submarine and Pepperland. I think that seem a little bit rushed, a little bit kind of organized to meet a deadline perhaps. But there's some creative ideas going around here as far as um, kind of how they are interpolating Beatles-related ideas into the soundtrack. I think of Sea of Time, I think, is really cool uh, with the very kind of Eastern-influenced instrumentation that, with its usage of drones, feels like a direct quote from Within You, Without You. Um, there's definitely an influence of, like, you, you get a Baroque influence or, like, a classical period influence. There's a little bit of Bach, maybe more so Mozart. Uh, but there's also a bit of a contemporary classical influence on some of these tracks, uh, which I think helps make the middle part where it's supposed to be more unsettling, uh, more evocative, I think, in that way. Um, I want to say George Martin was a big uh, devotee of Nino Rota, if memory serves. Um, and I think from my limited knowledge of Nino Rota's scores, I think you can hear that a little bit here. Um, I really like Sea of Holes, Sea of Monsters, Pepperland Laid Waste. I think those are, again, I think just really interesting little bits of uneasiness that work well in that kind of fragmented way that film scores do, right? Um, so there's merit to it, um, for sure. But I also understand that when someone wants to pick up a Beatles record, they want to hear Beatles music, so that piece of it is a little little less relevant. And frankly, side one is kind of a mess as far as the organization of it. I mean, you have two songs on there that were originally released on previous records, and the four new songs are all, none of them were recorded intentionally for the film, um, which that in and of itself doesn't really matter, but it does mean there's not a whole lot of cohesion. It does kind of feel like these are four very different sessions, four very different periods almost. Um, I really like the George songs, Only a Northern Song, and It's All Too Much. It's All Too Much especially, I think. You know, you definitely hear the Magical Mystery Tour era in there, that long kind of drawn out, drawn out outro to the song. Gives me some I, I Am the Walrus vibes. Um, Altogether Now is one of the most trivial things they ever did. Not a huge fan of it, but I do like it enough. And Hey Bulldog, which is the closest thing to a proper throwaway song that they ever did, actually ends up being possibly my favorite thing on here because of McCartney's bass groove and because of just the in enthusiasm here. You know, they don't give a shit. They know that they're kind of throwing it out, just trying to put something out there, but it works for how unique and how fun it is. So it's not, it does not work as a cohesive record, this one. But 
I don't want to disrespect it either. It's it's solid. There's a lot of individual songs that you can take away from it. And again, put some respect on the name of the film score inside too. It's solid stuff. It can't be anything but my bottom, but Yellow Submarine, I think a tad bit underrated if any Beatles album could possibly be. Number 12, I have 1964's Beatles for Sale. Now, I said at the outset that the Beatles are my favorite band of all time. They are what got me into music and talking about music and writing about it and everything else. They, they fascinate me to this day. So when I tell you that I think Beatles for Sale is a phenomenal record and probably one of the best albums of 1964, just understand that this is the level of appreciation and acclaim that I have for their music and that I think their music deserves. Even if you can argue that Beatles for Sale is one of the closest things that you'll find to a Beatles album that sounds uninspired, I actually think there's a lot of ingenuity here. And I think the ingenuity for Beatles for Sale comes in the fact that this is their most clearly country-influenced record. Um, It's not present on every song, by any means, but I think of I'm a Loser, which, you know, there's a little bit of potentially Dylan in there as well, for sure. Uh, but I definitely, there, there's a bit of a country twang to the guitars and what Lennon's trying to do. Certainly you hear it on the Carl Perkins covers. I don't want to spoil the party. I hear it. Um, Babies in Black, maybe a little bit. Um, you know, it does feel like it may be a more intense or dramatic version of an Everly Brothers song or something. And yeah, it, it, I, I like that side of the Beatles. It's an understated influence of theirs, I think, when we talk about their influence of rock and roll and R&B and how they absorb those things. But country music is a very important part of it. And the Carl Perkins influence is obvious here, even if I think that those two covers, Honey Don't and Everybody's Trying to Be, to be My Baby, are probably the two weakest things on here. But yeah, there's... One of my favorite parts of Beatles for Sale is the vocals that um, all, I mean, all four of them, I guess, to an extent, but especially I think the Lennon and McCartney harmonies on here are phenomenal. Certainly Babies in Black is a great example. I think McCartney's high harmony there is remarkable, so powerful, so well done. But I think of Eight Days a Week, um, Every Little Thing, I Don't Want to Spoil the Party, there's some subtly really difficult things that they are doing in the harmony stack as far as like how they're kind of interrelating with each other. There's parts where like Paul will jump over John and then John will jump over Paul um, and just kind of tweaking and playing with the timbres a little bit, but their vocals can also sound so similar that it it's hardly noticeable if you're not really listening for it. Um, and of course, words of love, the harmonies on that cover are phenomenal. Um, no replies, a fantastic opener. Off All of the Sun is an all-time McCartney ballad, which is remarkable when you think of how young he was when he originally wrote it. Um, it's not, again, it's not entirely a barn burner. Um, you do have a couple of songs that I think are among the weaker things that they ever did, but it's still really strong. I still would not argue that any other British band or American band or anybody was putting out work that was this consistently strong. And I've listened to a lot of British invasion groups from 1964 to get a sense of what they were doing. I genuinely do not think anyone else was on this level at that point. So in terms of everything else, it's obviously much closer to the bottom than it is to the top for me. And I don't think that will ever change. But Beatles for Sale at number 12, it's really strong and it only gets better. Number 11, I have 1963's With the Beatles. With the Beatles is... Uh, also, I think a little bit unfairly maligned. It suffers in comparison to Please Please Me in the sense that Please Please Me has a very real and live energy to it that with the Beatles can't really approach because uh, this is much more clearly a studio project. There's actual overdubs and things like that going on. But the trade off here is that because it's more polished and also, frankly, because you don't have John Lennon suffering from a cold for most of it. You get a record that I think has pluses to it and positives to it that Please Please Me doesn't really. Um, the opening like four song stretch here is remarkable. It's, dare I even say it, one of the best opening stretches of songs on any Beatles record. Uh, I think 
It Won't Be Long is an explosive intro, one of their best early songs. All My Loving, of course, is a great Paul number that almost seems just kind of thrown away. It seems like such an easy song as he is performing it that um, it's hard to believe kind of how strong it is and how natural he makes it sound. And I really like George Harrison's debut songwriting number, Don't Bother Me. It's very, again, kind of acerbic and very standoffish, which is a trait that maybe isn't as prominent in Harrison's writing as people think it is, but it's definitely there, and it was certainly there in his personality, so it works in that sense. I really love some of the covers on here. Um, I like all of them, but I really love especially the cover of Please Mr. Postman by the Marvelettes. Uh, you really got a hold on me by the Miracles. And then uh, Money, That's What I Want by Barrett Strong. I think all of those have a real strong energy to it. Please, Mr. Postman, I love the backing vocals on that one and the just real energy. I mean, they sell it on that one. And then the Lennon and Harrison kind of going back and forth on You Really Got a Hold On Me, I think is terrific. Really, the only tracks that I'm not as crazy about would be Little Child, which... A lot of people say Little Child is the worst Lennon-McCartney song on any Beatles record. I would be uh, probably inclined to agree with that. Uh, and then, I don't know, maybe Devil in Her Heart. Uh, I really like Not a Second Time, the penultimate track on there. I think that's a very unique kind of melody and chord progression idea. Um, and, yeah, I, I think even if you think that with the Beatles suffers in comparison to Please Please Me in that it's not meant to be a reflection of their live performances. I think this is stronger than people give it credit for. And so I come away with this one, I come away from this one with a lot of the same conclusions that I do with Beatles for Sale, which is, I think we are inclined to slag those two records off because it feels improper somehow to say that every single Beatles album is great. And so we want to find faults with something, and these are, along with Yellow Submarine, are kind of the easy targets for it. And I don't know. I think we just kind of have to reevaluate that a little bit. I think there's actually a lot of strength in here. Vocals are fantastic. The instrumental performances. Ringo's drumming on these tracks is phenomenal. Um, I'm going to be probably the millionth person to say this, which probably means it isn't true, but Ringo Starr, underrated drummer, certainly. And yeah, that's all there is to say with the Beatles. My number 11 great stuff. Number 10, I have the debut, 1963's Please Please Me. And Please Please Me, as I was saying in the With the Beatles section, you have a record here that is meant to capture the atmosphere of a live recording. And it, it only partially succeeds, and I say that in part because um, the middle part of the record is very clearly studio-created singles, Love Me Do, Please Please Me, and their respective B-sides. Uh, but I think really what it comes down to is like there's hardly anything in terms of like studio trickery, if you want to use the cliche, any sort of like studio tweaking that's going on. They add some echo to songs and that's kind of about it. And because of that, you certainly feel the energy of a live performance, even if it doesn't necessarily sound quite as ragged as you would expect a live performance to. Uh, And having this as a document is important because there's hardly any Beatles live performance documentation from before this record, from the days when they were performing in the Cavern Club inside of Liverpool. Um, I'm not super, super crazy about the song selection here, relatively speaking. Um, I think from a song to song standpoint, I would honestly prefer with the Beatles, but I think the energy that they provide to songs like Chains and Boys, which I might not necessarily have as much time for, I think really works. Again, I think the cover that they do of Boys, having Ringo sing that and then not reversing the gender roles, I think is, calling it a stroke of genius is very, I think, exaggerated. But it, it, it's clever and it's subversive in a way. And I just like that they decided not to change it. Um, a track that I think is really underrated here is A Taste of Honey. I think McCartney's vocal on that is really, really lovely. Um, and then the tracks that I think everybody knows are great are phenomenal. I saw her standing there. 
uh, is a really energetic opening bit. I love Lennon's vocal on Anna Go to Him. Some days I might even love it a bit more than his vocal on Twist and Shout. Um, but you cannot deny Twist and Shout at all, of course. Um, would I say it's better than the Isley Brothers version? I don't know that I would. I think they're quality versions of the songs in very different ways. And I think they each have their own sort of respective appeal. But it's a phenomenal closer. And credit to the um, the track before it, There's a Place, too. I think one of the most underrated early Lennon-McCartney songs. And then, of course, you talk about the singles. Uh, Please Please Me, I think, is their best song pre-She Loves You, if I were to say, um, if I were to try to pick one. Um, and, yeah, I just think it's a really, really well-written pop song, especially when you compare it to Love Me Do, which I think is very simplistic and not the most clever thing they've ever done. Yeah, it's a really great, really energetic record. I think all the band members also get a chance to shine here as well. And I think, you know, people hold this up, people hold this up in the pantheon of all-time greatest rock debut records, and I would not argue against that. I would not personally put it in my top five or top ten, probably especially knowing, you know, power of hindsight, but especially knowing what came afterwards. But again, you think about, I I have to keep saying this, you go back to the time and you go back to what other rock and pop music was coming out in 1963. Hell, what other Mersey beat music was coming out in 1963? And there just isn't anything that has the amount of character or energy or creativity that Please Please Me does. So I leave you with that. Please Please Me is a fantastic album and it can only get so high on the list because it is still relatively unpolished. But man, a lot of fun. And like I said, just a really remarkable release for the time. Please Please Me, number 10. Number nine, I have 1970s Let It Be. Okay, Let It Be is a can of worms to talk about and has been a can of worms since it came out originally. Everybody feels some type of way about the editorial decisions, I think, uh, that were made on here. This, of course, was the record that spawned from their attempt at making a uh, television uh, special back in early 1969, what ended up being called the Get Back Sessions at the time. Um, The result of those sessions, which of course didn't turn into anything directly was this mixture of studio jamming with the performances that they recorded on the rooftop of um, their recording studio in January of 69, their famous rooftop concert that ended up being their last performance. And the goal was to try to assemble that material somehow in some sort of cogent way, especially when the director of the special, Michael Lindsay Hogg, decided to make a feature film out of it. And there are so many different, you know, versions of the track listing and things like that, that, and, you know, picking different recordings, different versions of each song, that it's just, it's all a mess. And what we come out the other side with, I don't think makes anybody happy, Um, at least not entirely, especially when you take into account that Phil Spector was brought in, Spectre puts in orchestral overdubs for uh, three of the songs on here. And on top of that, they decide to bring back a song that was recorded two years prior across the universe and completely mess with the formatting of that song. I love Across the Universe. It's one of my favorite Beatles songs, but I'm not going to pretend like it belongs on this record really at all. It sounds extremely out of place. But... The thing is, if you can get past the editorial decision-making and the sequencing, and I do think this is the worst sequence Beatles record without much question, the overall quality of these songs, I think, is remarkable. And I think I really love how the focus here, after the band had spent several years of being these kind of studio magicians, as it were, the focus to go with a more raw sound, a more natural sound. You know, these aren't, you know, they're not necessarily like 
pulling it back all the way for a lot of these songs, but it does sound properly like a four piece band for a lot of this record, especially the rooftop songs. And the rooftop songs, I think, for the most part, work extremely well. I love Dig a Pony. I think uh, I've Got a Feeling is an absolute highlight, one of McCartney's best vocals ever on that. They bring back One After 909, this song that they wrote for the first time back in the late 50s, I believe. And, you know, it's not much of a song at its core, but the energy that they add here, especially with having Billy Preston as the fifth keyboard player on there, just, again, it's, it's infectious. And it's even more infectious when you actually watch the performance and this record, I think, has been helped in a lot of ways by the Peter Jackson Get Back documentary. It's painted this whole time period, a time period that people have said was very tense for the most part, and painted it in a more positive light. Again, maybe an overly positive light. I'm sure there were things that were left out that may have soured it a little bit, but it definitely allowed us to kind of reinterpret this record in a lot of ways. Um... And then, of course, you have stuff like Across the, again, Across the Universe. I don't think it fits, but I think the actual John Lennon song is remarkable. It's one of his best. Let It Be is one of the most omnipresent Beatles songs. Again, there's a real sort of gospel influence, a real uh, kind of soulful Ray Charles-like influence in a couple of these songs. Let It Be is definitely one of those. And, of course, The Long and Winding Road is. The only thing I'll say about The Long and Winding Road is... My favorite version of that song is the version that's on Anthology 3. It is literally this recording, but without the overdubs. And even though people critique it because John Lennon's bass playing on there is pretty lousy, um, and he's missing a lot of notes, it's really sloppy, um, it just, to me, it works better in that atmosphere. And I think the really overblown choral and orchestral overdubs on the album version don't really help the song, in my opinion. And so again, that's where, that's where I leave off. I think the quality of these tracks is phenomenal for the most part. And if maybe there was more consistency sonically, if they had opted to go entirely for studio versions and if the studio versions were worth a damn for some of these tracks, then this would be higher up on the list for sure. I really love what this record represents I'm just not necessarily crazy about what the end result was. But having said that, I've also heard things like the original Glenn Johns track listing for the record, the original mixes. I've heard the Let It Be Naked album that came out later, which was McCartney's vision of what Let It Be should have been like. I've heard both of those things. I don't think both of those hold up to the final product at all. So maybe this is the best we could have gotten. It probably is. And if it's the best we could have gotten, perfectly fine. And that's all I got. It's my number nine. Number eight, I have 1965's Help. A record that I always tend to underrate a little bit in terms of Help comes right before the sequence of albums in the Beatles catalog that people have sort of anointed as the chosen few, if you will. Uh... Rubber Soul coming after this, people believe that that record is a major leap over what came before it in terms of sophistication, songwriting, production, the whole nine yards. And I'm not going to try to push back against that, really, but I will say I think by taking that frame of thought, people are underrating help in the process. The first side of help is phenomenal. To me, it's straight banger out of after straight banger you have the title track which is one of Lennon's again one of Lennon's best songs ever very <clears throat> evocative in a personal way it cuts deeper than I think maybe you would realize again if you're not listening to it and you're enjoying it as a pop song you can have a grand old time but if you cut open kind of what the lyrics mean and what he's talking about you realize hey he's actually penetrating pretty deep and you know, it does kind of feel like he's opening himself up and being vulnerable and in that process turning into the John Lennon of future records, future solo records, who really couldn't hide anything from anybody and who was vulnerable to a fault, perhaps. 
but yeah, Lennon's great on that one. And of course, the Dylan pastiche, you've got to hide your love away, is terrific. Um, Paul, I love The Night Before, one of my picks for the most underrated early McCartney song. I think that's fantastic. And then Another Girl on that same side, which was another one of my picks for underrated McCartney track. It's trivial for sure, but I just think the melody is fantastic. I love the, again, the harmony stack there. I think Harrison's contribution, I Need You, is really, really great there. And Ticket to Ride, closing that first side, is a phenomenal bit of pop songwriting. Um, really sophisticated drum beat, just like how they pace themselves, how they structure the song, how the verse and chorus kind of relate to each other. And again, just the pure energy in the vocals. It's just, it's a remarkable bit of mid 1960s pop music. So side one is immaculate and side two is great. Uh, It suffers a bit because I really like the cover of Act Naturally here and I think Ringo Starr does a good job. Um, Is it Buck Owens? No. Uh, Ringo's voice is still pretty pitchy here. Clearly the weakest of the four Beatles from a singing standpoint. But it's entertaining. Um, Tell me what you see I like, but I've never considered it one of my favorites on the album. And you get to the two acoustic numbers I've just seen a face in yesterday, both by McCartney, both absolute classic tracks. Uh, do I love that they're back to back in the sequencing? Maybe if we're being nitpicky, I would say maybe split them up a little bit, but that's fine. And then they make the decision to put Dizzy Miss Lizzie on here. And Dizzy Miss Lizzie was initially recorded for an American album. Um, it's believed that it's purpose that it was purposely recorded for, a uh, one of the Capitol records in the United States. And they decide to throw it on here basically because they needed another song and they didn't really have anything else. And because of that, Dizzy Miss Lizzie, which is fundamentally not a bad cover, sounds incredibly out of place with everything else. And it especially sounds out of place coming after yesterday. It's just a total mood switch from the tender acoustic guitar and strings of yesterday to the screeching guitar line of Dizzy Miss Lizzie. It just, it does not work. It is the Let It Be might be the worst sequence Beatles album in full. This is the worst bit of Beatles sequencing on any record of theirs. But again, the quality of these songs to me is as good as 1965's pop and rock music gets. And some of these tracks, like Help, like Ticket to Ride, and like Yesterday, remain among their most popular and most loved songs of all time. And for good reason. I mean, everyone knows Yesterday. Everyone knows that melody. It's a lot of people's first song that they play on guitar. And there again, there's a simplicity to it that is lovely. But I also think that what that song represents from a historical standpoint is something so much more. Because again, you think about what they were doing in 65. This was not typical of your pop or rock musician to write a song with a, you know, a string quartet backing them. It's just really unique stuff. Really, again, groundbreaking, boundary pushing to keep throwing out cliches. And it's entertaining. It's fantastic front to back. And I love it. And it's painful that help is only, only number eight on this list. Number seven, I have 1964's A Hard Day's Night. I feel like a lot of people have A Hard Day's Night and Help back-to-back in their Beatles album rankings, and uh, it's kind of interchangeable as far as which one one puts above the other. And I think that's because their strengths are very similar. The strengths of both of these records are their first side. A Hard Day's Night side one is phenomenal. Again, Again, you start with the hit single, the title track, also John Lennon penned. And again, it's brilliant. It's maybe the highlight of the record. And it, you know, it, it's not necessarily as, it's not as revealing as Help is. A Hard Day's Night is very much their attempt at writing a damn good pop rock song. But what a damn good pop rock song it is, right? Um, even the tracks on side one that are more trivial, like I Should Have Known Better, uh, I'm happy just to dance with you. Uh, tell me why. I think they're all just really engaging. This whole record is just one big barn burner, I think. It's really fun, really fast-paced. Um, 
and just incredibly accessible as well. If I'm going to point anybody to one early Beatles record, it would be this one uh, without really much competition. Um, and then again, side one has tracks like If I Fell, which is a lovely bit of two-part harmony, perhaps my favorite bit of Lennon and McCartney harmony singing. Just really, again, how McCartney's melody mixtures with John's like lower harmony is so, so well done. And it's a hard lower harmony to sing. Trust me, I've tried it. And then And I Love Her, which is one of the best McCartney songs I think ever. It's just, again, tender very different atmosphere for a Beatles song in this era as far as the percussion sounds, the focus on acoustic instrumentation and things like that. It just it feels like a break in between all of these other fast-paced songs, but the sequencing works. It doesn't feel out of place either. It just feels like a natural pause. And it's remarkable. And then you end with Can't Buy Me Love, which is a, you know, it may not have necessarily been intended as a song to be written for a jazz artist in that sense, but it fits so perfectly in that vein that, of course, it's become one of the band's most covered songs because of its crossover into the jazz realm. I mean, fucking Ella Fitzgerald covered this thing within weeks of the album's release. It's remarkable. It's a, it's a fantastic song. And Side 2 is really, really great. Um, I still don't enjoy it quite as much, but at least... Compared to Help, which I think is the big difference, there's no clear weak point here. When I Get Home is probably my least favorite song because uh, it's a little bit discordant, I suppose, in the choruses. But again, maybe that's what makes it unique. I don't know. But, you know, Anytime at All, really, really good song. I'll Cry Instead. I love the kind of energy of that track. Um, you Can't Do That. Both of those songs are very similar, so... Um, you know, if you like one, you will probably like the other, but I appreciate that they separated them on the sequencing a little bit so it doesn't feel too repetitive. Uh, Things We Said Today is a great McCartney ballad, and then I'll Be Back is a really nice bit of kind of wrapping up the album. Um, and I think because of that bit of, you know, this being a much better sequenced album than Help is... And because I think Side 2 overall is probably stronger than Side 2 of Help, that's what gives this one the edge to me by at least that little bit. But Hard Day's Night is phenomenal. I will keep saying these same adjectives over and over again. Uh, but I think, again, you, you see it taking those first two albums and the sounds of those albums and building on them and just polishing them. And I don't think they ever sounded in this era more polished and more at the top of their game. I mean, this is Beatlemania at its peak encapsulated into a single record. That is what A Hard Day's Night is. And in that sense, there's a lot of value to it. It's really fun. It's one of the easiest records for me to just pick up and play it basically any time. And it gets my number seven spot. Number six is... Probably the closest thing to a controversial placing that I have in this ranking. Uh, I don't intend most of these discography rankings to be controversial in any sense, but, you know, in this case, I just felt like this was appropriate for it. At number six, I have 1965's Rubber Soul. Now, Rubber Soul is a phenomenal record. It takes what help does and expands on it, throws a bunch of new ideas and new influences into there and basically creates the melting pot from which albums like Revolver and Sgt. Peppers will later be spawned from. Um, and I don't necessarily have a particular weak point to put out for Rubber Soul, which is why it doesn't get above the other five, because I think this really does not have any flaws in the traditional sense of it. Um, maybe what keeps this a little bit lower and keeps it from approaching my top four, top five, or what have you, is just because I don't think this is quite as much of a leap from a songwriting standpoint from Help as it's maybe made out to be. I think you hear them expanding on ideas, but I think I don't necessarily view this as a radical shift. I think the most radical parts are 
some of the ideas that they are throwing in as far as beefing up the instrumentals, adding the sitar to Norwegian wood. Yes, it's an amateurishly played sitar, certainly, but it adds a unique feel to the record, and I think that in itself is valuable, and that's the type of thing that you hear. Think for yourself with the, uh, I believe, fuzz bass guitar that's going on there. I want to say that's on one of the tracks from Help, but it's a lot more prominent in Think for Yourself to me. Um, Michelle with a bit of French singing that Paul does in the uh, verses, I guess, of that um, and the choruses. Um, and then, of course, in my life, the little sped up piano bit um, that makes the keyboard solo sound like a harpsichord. It's a again, it's just these little creative decisions that they're not doing quite as much on help, but they're really starting to do here. I think in a way there was even potential maybe for this album to be even more fleshed out. But again, this is one of those records that they were recording with a very tight deadline for the Christmas season. So I think they only recorded it in three weeks or so. But what we get during that time and the quality of songs that we get is just immaculate. Again, Drive My Car, great bit of open, great opener. I think the harmonies on this album, I talked about how strong I think they are on Hard Day's Night, Beatles for Sale, and pretty much every album. But Rubber Soul, they're really getting some creative ideas going with like Drive My Car, the beep, 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 yeah, and the kind of cluster that they're doing there. Nowhere Man, these very clean three-part harmonies. Um, you also hear that in If I Needed Someone, very, you know, a very birds-like song, obviously. They're... There's a bit of folk rock influence here. It's not as augmented, not as emphasized as it is in the U.S. version of this album, but it's there. And then even Run For Your Life, which is the track that everybody dislikes for obvious reasons. Um, Run For Your Life, the choruses of that one have some very interesting little harmony bits. You have Harrison kind of doing his uh, falsetto high harmony, uh, which is not something you hear in a lot of Beatles songs. It's clever in that sense. Run for your life again. Your mileage will vary as far as how much you like it. I tend, I enjoy it um, as long as you take the lyrics with a grain of salt. Um, I don't necessarily think Lennon intended them to be autobiographical, as some people would believe. I think something like uh, "Getting Better" a couple years later, the line about being cruel to his woman, as it were. I think that's an intentional reference to his problems. I think this isn't, I think this is a character portrait and yes, you can feel uncomfortable with that. Totally understand that for me. I don't know. It's not something that has impeded my enjoyment of the song that much. What goes on is probably my least favorite thing on here. Cause it's the most, it's the closest thing to a Beatles by numbers song that you probably get. But again, otherwise, um, like I said, drive my car, you Won't See Me is fantastic. Uh, the Word, another song with great harmonies. Lennon is the star of the show here, I think. Norwegian Wood, Nowhere Man, Girl is phenomenal. Uh, but it's In My Life that I have to call out because In My Life is probably, if I were to pick my favorite Beatles song and possibly the song that I would pick as my number one of all time. And I think the reason for that is Something about it, whether it's the memories that I associate with it or what conjures up a deep emotion in a way that not a lot of music does for me these days, which is kind of a sad sentence to say out loud. But in my life, just hearing that opening guitar riff and then the harmonies coming in from Lennon and McCartney, uh, you know, that even to this day, that can get me to potentially well up a little bit. It's a song about nostalgia. It's a song about living in the past and thinking of the past, but also not living in it and trying to move on and respecting your memories while also trying to forge and make new ones. And I think that's a really powerful sentiment that Lennon just kind of jumps on here. And there's a lot that's encapsulated in that. And I just, I appreciate it. And it's something that even if the lyrics themselves, like if I'm looking at the lyrics, I'm not trying to think of a bunch of different interpretations there, but it's this song that can cause me to jump out and ruminate about other things and reflect on other things. And 
yeah, I don't know. That, that's about as high of a compliment as I can get for a set of lyrics and for a piece of music. So it's amazing for me to say all this and say all these complimentary things and then only have Rubber Soul in my number six. But you know what? That's the way the cookie crumbles. It's fantastic. And if I haven't made it clear already, I would highly recommend basically every album on this list. But Rubber Soul, number six. I will say potentially the best starter album. If you're looking to get started with the Beatles, this might be your best bet. But yeah, only at number six, Rubber Soul. Number five, I have 1967's Magical Mystery Tour. I think people tend to rate this album a bit lower because of either the sequencing of it or maybe just the premise of it itself. I think people feel weird about rating an album in the top five of any sort of Beatles ranking that, you know, is perhaps dubiously considered a proper studio album. I understand that perspective to an extent, I suppose, but I also don't think we can deny the quality of songs on here. And I think people don't necessarily, you know, people, they can't deny the quality of songs on here. So even if they say, well, in principle, on principle, I am not putting Magical Mystery Tour in the top five, but I can only have it at like number six or number seven. I can't put it any lower because the songs are too damn good. My perspective is the songs are fucking great. The sequencing to me is not really much of a problem. I actually think it works um, with how the American track listing has it. So, no, I'm going to rate it as far as the merit of the tracks over here. And there's no doubt that this is one of the most stacked Beatles albums out there. Um, the actual film soundtrack piece that comprises the first half of the LP is has some of the more kind of underrated Beatles gems on there. In particular, I think Blue Jay Way is great. Um, this very mysterious George Harrison piece, um, kind of in the vein of like Only a Northern Song, um, which was on Yellow Submarine later on. Um, but I love the kind of fogginess of it and the um, sort of unease surrounding it. And your mother should know, again, if we were talking about Paul as fan of vaudeville and early jazz and that sort of thing uh your mother should know is in that vein you know it's not brassy in the way that when i'm 64 is but it's cut from that same cloth and i think it works really well it's just a great little melody and then the fool on the hill which is a reasonably popular song it makes its way onto some of the popular compilations but i don't I still think people underrate this song because, again, to me, I think this is one of Paul's best songs that he wrote while he was with the Beatles. I think it's just a lovely kind of semi-nonsensical sentiment, but also very real in how kind of isolating it is. You know, the fool on the hill sees the world spinning round. Um, this just, again, this theme of kind of being separated from society and no one really understanding them. Um, it's a very Lennon-like sentiment that McCartney kind of expresses here and to me pushes back on the idea that Lennon was the so-called serious one and McCartney was the more kind of fun-loving, playful, uh, shallow one. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, you obviously have to reckon with the singles that are on here. Uh, the singles from 1967 for the Beatles, it's three of the strongest individual singles that they ever released. I have a full video with Tom Williams from Williams Schmilliams that talks about all of the different Beatles singles, so more in-depth thoughts there. But, I mean, an album that has I Am The Walrus, Hello Goodbye, Strawberry Fields Forever, and Penny Lane on it as back-to-back-to-back-to-back tracks is, I mean, that that is stacked almost no matter what else you have on it. Four of the best Beatles songs from that era and perhaps of any era. You know, Hello Goodbye, probably the weakest of them, but I think it's still a really fun song. Um, I Am the Walrus, Strawberry Fields, two of Lennon's best ever as far as getting very abstract and very psychedelic. It's a very strange period of Lennon's career here, but I think, you know, that abstraction and how it informs his later music where he becomes a little bit more grounded again is really interesting. And I really like that. 
Uh, and then Penny Lane, which is an extremely well-composed, well-orchestrated, brilliant pop song, absolutely at the level of what, you know, something like the Beach Boys was doing at that point. Fantastic. Um, really, again, side two, I think maybe the only slightly weaker point is Baby, You're a Rich Man, which I really, really like. I don't necessarily love it. And All You Need Is Love, maybe I've never been as crazy about it as some of the other singles from this era, but... Again, if we think about the Beatles in a moment in time and what they meant and what the world and what society was kind of doing around them, All You Need Is Love represents perhaps naive hope, but it's, it's a hope that you want to believe in nonetheless. I think there's maybe a cynicism that we, that certainly I approach some of Lennon's later piece work, like Give Peace a Chance or whatever. There's a cynicism that I approach that sort of thing with, with a sort of, hey, well, you should know better type of thing, especially after the events of 1968. But All You Need Is Love feels more innocent in a very genuine way. And I don't know, it's infectious. I buy into it. That's totally fine. And yeah, Magical Mystery Tour, it's a phenomenal bit of work. Is it the most well-sequenced Beatles record ever? No. But I'm not going to hold the mere existence of it and the controversy of its mere existence against it for the sake of this discussion. It's my number five. It's phenomenal. It has some of the best Beatles songs ever on it. Put some respect on its name. Okay, we, we have hit the top four, and the top four, I think, are probably the big four, if you will, as far as them being in most people's top four. And I think the question then becomes or the organization of them. I'm not going to necessarily say it depends on the day because I think there are a couple that are consistently higher than others on this list, but I think all of these have been in contention for my number one spot at least, if not just outright my favorite Beatles album. So keep that in mind when we talk about these records. My number four is going to be 1967 Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Again, as, as I was saying, I don't know that this is necessarily ever outright my number one, but I think this has definitely been contention for it, um, especially when the Giles Martin remix came out in 2017, kind of helped me listen to the album with new ears for the first time in a very long time. Sgt. Pepper's is a very difficult, complicated record to talk about because there's a lot of expectations and a lot of history that comes with it and its acclaim. I will say it's very interesting to read about how, you know, Sgt. Pepper sort of immediately jumped into kind of the forefront of the public knowledge when it came out um, in terms of like how seriously people were taking it. People enjoyed other Beatles albums. People respected other Beatles albums. But Sgt. Pepper's was just on a whole other level where the, not just the masses, but the hippies, the critics, the, you know, professional music scholars were all absorbed with it. They were all obsessed with it. And, you know, it, it speaks to, again, when we talk about contextualizing the Beatles in their time, how vastly different they were from whatever else was going on. Psychedelic music was coming out in 1967, and you have groups like the 13th Floor Elevators that are absolutely in existence at this point. But to take these ideas and mix it with all of these, again, these various different influences, I mean, something like Within You, Without You, still, again, no other group is doing something like Within You, Without You in 1967. They just aren't. And... So even if you can argue that something like, I don't know, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, that maybe there are other groups that are approaching that type of sound in psychedelia, no one is doing Within You Without You. No one's doing When I'm 64. It's such a diverse bit of material that is going into it. And when you kind of take a step back from contextualizing in its time and recognizing how different Sgt. Pepper's is from its contemporaries, it actually kind of stands out even amidst the Beatles catalog as kind of an odd duck. It doesn't really sound like Revolver at all, 
and it sure as hell doesn't sound like the White Album. And even Magical Mystery Tour, I would argue, is already exploring kind of different areas of psychedelia and rock music and, you know, just going for a sound that feels a little bit more grounded and real than what Sgt. Pepper is. Sgt. Pepper, you know, the whole fake band concept that they are doing, it feels like they buy into it. It kind of doesn't feel like a record that is made by real players on some level. Um, but real players they were, and the creativity here, of course, is off the charts. This album rocks when it wants to. Um, certainly the opening track, I think, is a great example of that. Um, <clears throat> Good Morning, Good Morning is really heavy. Ringo coming through with the double bass drums on that one is fantastic. Um, and of course, this album does ballads extremely well. Um, whether it's uh, fixing a hole, kind of sort of a ballad. She's Leaving Home, of course, is a beautiful bit of true Baroque pop in every sense of the word. Um, and then again, these kind of more off-kilter tracks like Getting Better and Lovely Rita that are just drenched in this British sarcasm that is just absolutely phenomenal. It also features probably the best Lennon McCartney written vehicle for Ringo to shine with a little help from my friends. It's, you know, I mean, it is probably the definitive Ringo Starr song in a lot of ways, not just because it represents what his career turned into as a solo artist. I don't necessarily mean that in a derogatory way, by the way. But also, it just, it, it works for what his skill set was at the time. It sets him up for success. And... I and I still love it and to this day it's a it's a contender for my favorite song on the record although recently within you without you is probably up there just cuz I think that is an entrancing song to me it's the best thing that Harrison ever did when it comes to incorporating indian or eastern inspired music in his songs and I haven't even talked about tracks like Fixing a Hole, which I think is a brilliant McCartney melody and brilliant McCartney vocal that is super underrated. And of course, the closing track, A Day in the Life, which everyone has expressed a lot of adoration for as far as how much creativity it offers. Again, I think that when I compare A Day in the Life to other Beatles songs that I would put near the top of the list, Strawberry Fields Forever comes to mind. It's the first one that I popped up in my head. I have never thought that A Day in the Life is an, a more creative song than Strawberry Fields Forever. Um, I just think that A Day in the Life is augmented and boosted by its being the closing track on this record. I think if A Day in the Life had been released as a single, I think it would have done well, and Strawberry Fields was put in its place, I think it would be Strawberry Fields that most music listeners would be talking about as the greatest Beatles song of all time. No disrespect against A Day in the Life, and I think if people think it's the best of all time, they're welcome to it. Personally, for me, I don't know if it's ever really been a contender for me, but that is not to take away from the fact that there's the multiple different sections, the very kind of surrealistic lyrics, and the, the cacophony of sounds that it plays around with. I'm Not me trying to take away from any of that. It's a remarkable piece of music and a remarkable piece of art and yeah it's you know again sergeant pepper there's so much to talk about it people have written books and scholarly works on this record in a way that only something like pet sounds really approaches um or exceeds maybe and i th i think maybe i prefer the beatles when they are a little bit more down to earth not necessarily unplugged but a bit more connected to reality and this feels like the most detached version of the Beatles that we get and because of that like I said I don't know if it's ever been my true number one Beatles album and maybe it never will be but number four with a catalog this fantastic is no that's no slouch it's remarkable great album number three I have 1966's Revolver Revolver is an album that for a very long time has not gotten the due that it has deserved. And again, to talk about 
that in the context of a Beatles album feels really strange, but just understand that Revolver has lived in the shadow of Sgt. Pepper's for most of its, you know, existence, pretty much. Um, And a large part of that was due to American audiences not experiencing the album how it was originally released. When, you know, the CDs came out of the albums for the first time in the late 1980s, and of course the CDs that were most available were the UK versions, American audiences got exposed to the UK version of Revolver, and they were like, oh, holy shit, okay, this works a bit more when there is actual John Lennon representation on the album, because Lennon is, I think he only has two songs on the US version. And... Revolver since then, I think, has really exploded in acclaim. People realize how this album has built itself off of Rubber Soul and how much of a huge leap forward this album is from Rubber Soul. And in that sense, I think people have really started to anoint this record as being the explosion, the beginning of the Beatles' great period in a way that we used to talk about Sgt. Pepper's. And I'm really grateful for that. Again, not to um, deride Sgt. Pepper's in any way, but Revolver is an album that the more I listen to it, the more I just find myself amazed at what they're doing and amazed at how relevant this music is, at how much I hear some of these sounds in contemporary rock bands and indie rock bands. Um, it's, it, it feels like the influence, whether it's the influence of LSD that's a lot more prominent here, the wild experimentation with studio setups that they're doing, again, the idea of like close micing bass drums and uh, automatic double tracking and backwards tape loops and things like that. Just all of these ideas that they are playing around with form the bedrock of what rock music would turn into over the coming, you know, almost 58 years now since it was released. And that's not something that necessarily you recognize immediately when you listen to it. I think for me it took quite a while to understand just how much of a leap forward it is, but it it deserves its place in history. It deserves the anointed place that it's received. Um, Song quality, again, for the most part, is absolutely immaculate and flawless. Uh, Harrison, at this point, is really becoming a major figure in the songwriting. He had two songs on Help uh, and two songs on River Soul as well, Uh, but he gets three here, and those three songs are Taxman, which is a phenomenal piece of guitar playing, Love You Too, his first real headfirst foray into the Hindustani classical style. And then I want to tell you, which is this, not everybody's favorite song from this record, but I think is so unique in how just kind of um, discordant it is, how almost, you know, I'm not going to say atonal, but the dissonance, the dissonance in some of like the keyboard parts and things like that. Um that it's just, it's a creative little thing to be putting on. And again, like this is a Beatles record. This is the most popular band in the world. And they are playing with these very, very clearly dissonant chords and entirely different musical styles that no one else was um, experimenting with, not to this depth. Um, I talked about Lennon. Lennon's songs here are, for the most part, just absolute masterclasses in psychedelic songwriting I'm Only Sleeping and Tomorrow Never Knows both make heavy usage of tape loops and uh, backwards guitars and things like that Um, Tomorrow Never Knows is just I mean it's such an ingenious bit of production and sound design again this is the part where I talk about like I think production transcends into actual sound design here I think it's a fantastic bit of work and The drum part that Ringo performs here is um, energetic and spectacular and just totally drives the song. It probably would have worked on some level without it, but I think Ringo's drumming is the key to making it this masterpiece that it is and, again, potentially the highlight of the record. 
And then she said, she said, and your bird can sing some of the best bits of guitar playing on the record. Um, and some of these, again, just very eccentric and abstract lyrical ideas that Lennon is playing around with at this period. It's really interesting. Uh, and then McCartney. And McCartney, to me, is possibly the heart and soul of this record. If Lennon was the sort of bedrock of Rubber Soul, contributing a lot of that record's best songs, to me, McCartney does the same for Revolver. Um, they are a lot of the most tuneful songs on the record. You know, I, I, a lot of people underrate McCartney's ability to experiment in his compositions, but admittedly, that's not necessarily what his focus is here. But even then, Eleanor Rigby, one of my all-time favorite Beatles songs, um, it, it's a step beyond what he was doing with Yesterday, and now it's just a piece of music that is entirely strings with Beatles vocals. No Beatle plays an instrument on here. It's, and the lyrics are, again, very dark for a guy who has historically been painted as very upbeat and very trivial. Now, these are very dark and saddening lyrics. And, you know, when I think of like the sentiments of In My Life, talking about memories and things like that, and um, remembering those who are gone, McCartney and Eleanor Rigby is talking about those who are not remembered and those people who are anonymous, faceless, that we never know and that we never get to know who live and die without making um not without making an impact on the world but maybe without having a loved one to know them to remember them and to cherish that memory and it feels like kind of two like a light and dark side of the same coin um not to read into that too much because i don't think that connection actually exists but it's interesting to think about it in those terms and to kind of audiate it as i'm talking here and then, of course, Here, There, and Everywhere, inspired by Pet Sounds, beautiful bit of um, harmony singing, very don't talk, put your head on my shoulder-like. Um, for No One, again, kind of more cutting lyrics than you would expect from McCartney. Very tragic and dark track. But, of course, there's upbeat ones, Good Day Sunshine and Got to Get You Into My Life. I think both serve those purposes extremely well. Um, it's just, again, there's, there's a lot here that feels more directly connected to contemporary music than a lot of the kind of other rock music coming out in this era from uh, any other artist. And to my, for my money, anyways, more so than what was coming out in Sgt. Pepper's. I think Sgt. Pepper's, again, is a bit more of a removed record from so much else of what was going on but revolver to me i think you can draw a line between this and a lot of the indie rock music and rock music of the last 20 30 years or so phenomenal album it's only number three but again i mean at this point we're talking we're nitpicking for faults at this point and i think anyone who wants to start with any of these records as their intro to the beatles would be uh well well served would be well served Apart maybe from my number two. And my number two is the self-titled record from 1968, most commonly known as The White Album. In my heart, this might be my number one. And the reason I say that is because The White Album was maybe the first Beatles record that I fell in love with. I think I talked about this in a different video that I did very early on in the channel. Um, but the first Beatles albums I ever heard were the Red and Blue compilations. Um, and it originally released in 73. And the first, I think, proper studio album that I listened to or at least fell in love with was this one. And the White Album is, again, it's a complicated record to talk about because there's a lot going on here. There is a lot in terms of musical ideas. Again, and it's not just musical ideas that are being edited or condensed or reformatted to fit a consistent sound. No, this is just, hey, here are four musicians who at this point are not necessarily getting along super well um, who are writing a lot of things independently. And because of it, it sounds like, in a way, four different solo records on some level. 
that are all kind of coming together. Um, in reality, of course, the White Album is very Lennon and McCartney dominated. Harrison writes four songs on here. Ringo writes one. And to talk about those songs, Ringo's song is not one of the highlights for me. It's very simplistic. Again, a lot of his songs, certainly of this era, were very kind of, you know, two, three chord things. Um, but I do like the fiddle sound, the drums on that track, which are played by McCartney, I believe, which was a more a relatively recent revelation, um, are really solid. Um, yeah, again, it's merely a really good song, but it's probably my second or third least favorite on a record that has 30 songs on it. Um, the Harrison tracks... Man, George came to play on this one after continually writing some of the better songs on some of their previous albums, and in the case of Sgt. Pepper's, my favorite song on that album right now. He comes out with While My Guitar Gently Weeps, Piggies, uh, Long, 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 and Savoy Truffle. Piggies is, tr is trivial, but it's sardonic, and it's that quality of George that a lot of people like, and in that sense, I really appreciate it. Uh, Savoy Truffle is also pretty trivial, but I love the brass on that. That absolutely hits hard, and especially the 2018 remix, I think, really causes the brass to shoot through the mix. But While My Guitar Gently Weeps is another contender for my favorite Beatles song, um, and some days I might even prefer it over In My Life. It's just perfect, immaculate songwriting. And it's immaculate ensemble playing, too. Remember, this is a four-piece ensemble, five, because Eric Clapton's involved playing the lead guitar. And they all complement each other in these interesting ways, like the guitars and the bass don't really overshadow each other. When the guitar comes in for the solo and becomes a clear feature, everything else plays around it, but is still doing interesting things fundamentally. It's just so, 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 so well done. Um... The vocals are fantastic, in particular the bass line. I love the bass line on While My Guitar Gently Weeps. And then Long, 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 which is which comes after Helter Skelter, the extreme, you know, proto-heavy metal song, if you want to consider it that. That is the most intense thing on this record, also one of the best songs on the record. And Long, Long, Long cuts everything down to the quietest of sounds. And... It's so intimate and so lovely, um, but so impassioned. Again, the bridge section and then that haunting vocal and the, the outro of it, it's just, it, it, it's really, really, really phenomenal and expressive arranging and producing. It's a phenomenal song. I love it. And I love it extra because of the connection to Elliot Smith, one of my favorite artists. Not to get into that right now. Um, but yeah, George comes through with flying colors on here, and I think it's especially this record where he rejects the notion that Lennon and McCartney are the clear two best songwriters at this point. But again, Lennon and McCartney are, you know, no slouches here either. Um, Lennon at this point is definitely becoming a bit more disinterested with the whole Beatles thing, but you can't necessarily tell that on these records. Um, these His songs are more stripped back and more raw than what he was doing on Sgt. Pepper's or Magical Mystery Tour, but there's still a lot of um, power behind them. I mean, you can't tell that he's just phoning it in on stuff like uh, Your Blues, Sexy Sadie, Everybody's Got Something to Hide Except Me and My Monkey, um, and of course not on Dear Prudence, which might be my favorite Lennon song on here. Um, or at least it's joint compared to Happiness is a Warm Gun. Um, Dear Prudence, you get the more intimate side. Happiness is a Warm Gun is just this, you know, proto sort of schizophrenic almost collection of songs that are merged together to create one super song from all these fragments. And again, surrealistic lyrics, but it rocks hard. The guitars are raw. The energy is there, and yeah, it's really, really, really well done. And then McCartney comes in, and I think like Revolver, I might go so far as to say that McCartney's songs are my favorites here. Um, I love Obladi Oblada, I don't care what anyone says, I think it's a phenomenally fun track. Um, and you get some of his absolute best bits of ballad work here. Um, 
Blackbird, I Will, Mother Nature's Son. If you really wanted to count it, you could probably count Rocky Raccoon. You know, Rocky Raccoon, I think, is very much a parody in some ways. I mean, it's not sincere in the same way. In the same way that I will is, but it's still it it's still Paul in his intimate form, in a way I think predating what he would do on his early solo projects. Of course, the song "Junk" from his first solo album was written around this time, and it's just again it speaks to McCartney's talent that he can go from something like "Why Don't We Do It in the Road," which has this very intense raw, powerful vocals to I Will, which is the definition of softness. And that duality and that contrast is the appeal of the White Album to me. It is a record that is defined by these contrasts, these comparisons, this jumping back and forth between approaches. And it's all one big heaping mess, to tell you the truth. But in that mess, to me, there are so many phenomenal ideas, so many great songs, and so many songs that truly have endured throughout time. I'm making this video just a few weeks after the release of Cowboy Carter by Beyonce, where she covers Blackbird. I mean, it speaks for itself. And, you know, if we're talking about, like, from a consumer standpoint, <laughs> investing in a Beatles album, and getting bang for your buck. It's hard to argue with the White Album. It's not the most cohesive list out of all of these, but certainly it is, um, it, it's got the largest amount of quality songs by, uh, for really undebatably. Um, and to get it out of the way, Revolution 9. Everyone has an opinion on Revolution 9. Most people don't really like it. I don't listen to it very often, but... Again, if we're talking from the experimentation side of it and just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks, Revolution 9 feels like it has its perfect home towards the end of the record. Like, sure, let's just do this music concrete piece right at the very end um, and just assume that people will be okay with it and that people will be receptive to it because we've just done 28, 29 other songs that have totally fascinated you throughout the whole time. And for my money, Revolution 9, to me, because it's the Beatles song I've heard the least probably in my life, it's the one I get the most out of these days because it's the one I'm the least familiar with. So I'll listen to it and I'll hear new things each time. So there's value in that. In any case, White Album, like I said, in my heart, probably my number one, but in terms of song-to-song -song quality and as far as how likely I would be to listen to this record at any given moment, it's going to come at number two. All right, and as rain comes through the area as I'm filming, which I'm sure is making the camera go out of focus a little bit, let's talk to my, um, my number one. My number one is 1969's Abbey Road. Um, Abbey Road, you're, you're sort of lost for things to say at this point because this entire video has been probably an hour and a half, almost two hours of just praise. But Abbey Road, to me, gets the number one spot, really without much question in my mind, because if I want to talk to someone about the idea of what an album means and what people look for in a record as a medium in and of itself, and when we think of an album... Right, We think of it as a collection of songs. And it's only been, <clears throat> you know, in the last 60-odd years, 70 years or so, um, that we have thought of collections of songs as something that could potentially exist on its own and exist on its own merits as something greater than the sum of its parts. When you think of stuff like Woody Guthrie's Dust Bowl Ballads, Frank Sinatra's In the Wee Small Hours, things like that, these are records that are intentionally compiled to create a mood or to make a statement, to tell a story, whatever the case may be. And because of that, even though the songs are fantastic on their own, they rise to something more when they are packaged in this collection. 
And when I want to tell somebody what a great example of that is, to me, I pick Abbey Road. Abbey Road doesn't tell a story. Abbey Road isn't necessarily there to create a consistent mood. It was certainly wasn't made with the idea that it was going to be the Beatles' last record, and that's a common misconception that a lot of people have. The band didn't know that it was not going to exist until, um, well, months after the album released, but John Lennon didn't leave the band until around the time that it was released. Um, they were planning on recording other, other music shortly afterwards. And the, the point is, this was not a consciously final album. But you could fool me. And if we're talking just in the sense of album flow, how do songs lead from one to the other? How do each individual side, how does each individual side open and close, if we're thinking about it as an actual vinyl record, side A and side B, right? To me, I don't think there's a better example of how to construct an album from a flow standpoint. Um, I think each of the songs, to say it serves a purpose seems cliched, but I think each song leads really well tonally into what comes after it. Like, for instance, Abbey Road, I... The, the first side of Abbey Road, I almost feel as a piece of music that grows in intensity a little bit, gradually. Um, it's gradual, and I think it comes in waves, because you start with Come Together, which is dark, but not especially intense, and that leads into the smoother something. You get into Maxwell Silver Hammer, which is more jaunty and upbeat, which turns into Oh Darling, which is more aggressive. Um, oh Darling has kind of an uncertain ending and that allows you to kind of transition into the more breezy Octopus's Garden and then that leads into I Want You She's So Heavy which is this very dark and very heavy piece that builds and, and the outro builds and builds and builds and builds in intensity and then it cuts off and that's it and there's silence and that's what you end that first side with and then side two which opens with this delicate Acoustic guitar, and here comes the sun. Which then leads into Because, which then leads into the famous medley, as it were, the long one, as they referred to it. Um, the collection of little snippets of songs, and saw and full-length songs, and song fragments, and things like that, that literally flow into each other to the point where there are no concrete beginnings or endings for most of these. They just genuinely flow into one another. And again, it just kind of accelerates the momentum towards the end, the literal end of the album. And then after the end, there's silence again, and then they come back with the chord and the hidden track, Her Majesty, and that's it. It's just, there's, it, it feels so natural, and yet... In, in both sides, on both sides of the record, they have ways of kind of subverting your expectations and surprising you. And that, for however conscious that may have been, and I'm sure to some extent there was a conscious decision in there, and in some ways it wasn't, and it's just a happy little accident, it's, it's amazing. It's remarkable. And that's not even me talking about the actual quality of the songs. Most of the tracks on this record, I think it's fair to say, are um, household names on some level. Um, and I talk about Revolver as having a very direct influence on rock music and pop rock music of the present day. Abbey Road does too. But Abbey Road to me feels like this is a record that has always had influence. I can pick... A particular year, probably any time between 1969 and the present day, and I can go through, you know, a list of popular rock albums or popular pop albums of that time, and I virtually guarantee you I can find one record or one album that takes cues very, very, very clearly from Abbey Road. Maybe it's a particular song. Maybe it's, you know, you can make the argument of I Want You, She's So Heavy, right? There are some people who argue that that track influenced 
sludge metal in some way or you know some of the earlier metal groups um you could talk about like here comes the sun and how it influenced you know countless ballads and um kind of sunshine centric tracks afterwards you can talk about what one that i always like to bring up because i don't think people talk about it ever is sun king to me sounds very much like a modern indie pop song in terms of the guitar tones, in terms of these haunting harmony singing that goes around it. It's, again, it, it just, it all feels rooted in something that is very real. And to an extent, yes, you credit the album, and obviously I'm crediting the album because I have it at number one, but I think that just also speaks to the pervasiveness of the Beatles' influence in 1969. I think that, you know, they're such an omnipresent band that even a record they released that was somewhat mediocre, like if enough people heard it and enough people were going to hear it because it was the Beatles, you know, there was, go there was going to be something in there that probably resounded, that stuck with us. And Abbey Road has the double distinction of not just being a record released by the Beatles at a time when they were very prominent and also happening to be the last record that they released while they were still together. But it also happens to be a record of just really high quality songs. Um, come together, super dark, super phenomenal bass and drum groove on that track. Really great. It would be unsettling if it wasn't just so bizarre. Um, it, it almost feels comical in a way. Um, Maxwell Silver Hammer, I think very similarly, very comical song that plays with these dark themes, but almost seems to be making light of them. Something, no notes, um, you know, when Frank Sinatra called it, I think Frank Sinatra called it the greatest Lennon McCartney song ever, which is very funny. Um, but yeah, when Sinatra com compliments your love ballad as a guy who's sang probably thousands of love ballads in his career, that says something. Um, no pun intended. Oh, Darling, one of McCartney's best vocal performances ever. Probably my pick for his best vocal performance as a Beatle. I think maybe, like, maybe I'm amazed has it beat when we talk about his solo career. Really ragged sounding. Love the double-tracked vocals and the choruses that are just so amazingly powerful. Octopus's Garden, massive improvement over Don't Pass Me By when we talk about Ringo's songs. Just a, a song that clearly has been fleshed out really well. George Harrison really helping with that. Um, by all accounts, just a really um, cute and clever piece of work. And then I Want You, She's So Heavy, which is dark for a very long time, was my favorite um, song off the album, and maybe my favorite Beatles song. Um, it just, it's, again, heavy, disturbing, um, but seductive in a very dark way. And it's an interesting comparison. It's hard to talk about the tracks off on the long one as individual pieces, but I think You Never Give Me Your Money and She Came In Through the Bathroom Window and Golden Slumbers are all fantastic bits of Paul writing. Um, right before the, the long one, you had Because, which has maybe the best harmony singing in their entire career. Um, in fact, I would almost say definitely the best harmony singing of their entire career, which is a remarkable statement to make. And... Yeah, it just, again, these are fragments of songs um, or incomplete songs that are strung together and don't really have any relationship to each other apart from me, Mr. Mustard, and Polythene Pam. But it works. It, it, it works extremely well, and I wish that I had better words to describe it at this point. But them's the breaks. The point is... Abbey Road is a stunning, effectively, a send-off for their career, even if that wasn't the intention. And, you know, I always end up coming back to this one, even when I grow a little bit tired of it, and maybe I'm in the mood to have Revolver as my favorite Beatles album, or the White Album as my favorite Beatles album. I always come back to this one. I always come back to this one, and somehow or some way, this one always makes its way back to the top. And I think that says a hell of a lot. I don't have anything else to add to that piece. Abbey Road's my number one. If you haven't listened to it for whatever reason, you gotta. 
All right, that was a lot of content, a lot of talking, and a lot of opinions. But I'm very curious to see what your rankings of the Beatles albums are, if you've made it this far. And if you have, God bless you. And I always enjoy talking about this band. I understand they are the most popular band in the world, and in theory, nothing new could be said about them. Um, But I'm not one to let that stop me either. I want to talk about both the undersung groups, the undersung undersung artists, and the popular ones and the acclaimed ones. So hopefully this was of interest to you. Um, Let me know what your favorite Beatles albums are. Let me know what your favorite Beatles songs are. If you have a ranking, throw them in the comments below. Please make sure to like and subscribe as well um, and kind of support the channel that way. Uh, Hit that bell for notifications so you know when new videos are coming. And then tell a friend as well. Word of mouth is the best kind of exposure that one can get would really help me get this channel continue to grow and continue to put out more discography rankings, reviews, and all that fun stuff. So until next time, I will see you right here at your home on the Music Deep Dive.